You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and this episode is sponsored in part by Humanities New York. Humanities New York's mission is to strengthen civil society and the bonds of community, using the humanities to foster engaging inquiry and dialogue around social and cultural concerns. Learn more at humanitiesny.org. What survives at the New York Historical Society is a fragment, just a piece, of the tail of the horse. It is a beautiful object. It has these forms that kind of cascade from top to bottom. We see these curls that kind of move left and move right. As a fragment, it's got a lot of motion and it has a lot of dynamism to it. It's pretty small. It's only 13 inches in length. And this is one of the reasons that we know that it was merely a part of a much longer form of the tail. It does possess some of its original gilding. It gives us the faintest sense of how an object like this might have shimmered and gleamed in the sunlight in Lower Manhattan in 1776. Its power has been recognized. So in 2012, the New York Times did a story on 50 objects, identified 50 objects by which the city's history could be remembered. And the tail of the horse was one of the key objects that were mentioned as one of the key ways in which to remember the city and to remember the revolution. How do we remember the American Revolution? On a day like July 4th, we often remember the words of the revolution as embodied in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The words of the revolution matter to us, and they matter to the Americans who lived through the revolution. Words are one way that Americans remember and find meaning in the revolution. But the words of the Declaration of Independence are not the only aspect of the American Revolution that carry power. Visual and material objects from during and after the revolution also carry power and meaning. Objects like monuments, uniforms, muskets, powder horns, and the horse's tail, a remnant of a grand equestrian statue of King George III, which stood atop a 15-foot-high pedestal in New York City's Bowling Green Park. In honor of the 4th of July, this episode, episode 306, will investigate the history of revolutionary New York City and how New Yorkers came to their decisions to both install and tear down a statue to their king and what happened to this statue after it came down. It's a story that will reveal the power of visual material objects and how they help us remember the American Revolution. Now, to best understand the horse's tail and the larger statue that it came from, we need to better understand the history, people, and landscape of early New York City from before the Revolution. This is why we'll turn to Wendy Bellion, a professor of history and the Sewell C. Biggs Chair of American Art History at the University of Delaware. Wendy is the director of the Center for Material Culture Studies at the University of Delaware and the author of the book, Iconoclasm in New York, Revolution to Reenactment. New York City around 1776 would probably be comparable to something on the scale of a small town. The population is a fraction of what it is in New York City today. About 20,000 people lived and worked in Manhattan in the decade before independence. And the city geographically was also small and compact. In appearance, it probably closely resembled something like the Dutch city, which it had been for a previous century. By 1776, it only extends about a mile north of where Wall Street remains today. And Wall Street, of course, was the boundary of the original Dutch settlement. Beyond Wall Street was a green space that was owned by the city that was known as the Fields or the Common. And that was one of the main open spaces, one of the main meeting grounds for settlers, for enslaved people, and for indigenous people who lived within Manhattan at that point. Beyond the commons is really country. There were some people who lived outside of Wall Street. In fact, the free Negro lots, as they were called, which were parcels of land given to African-Americans during the Dutch period, those were outside of Wall Street. And there were Native Americans farther north on the island of Manhattan. But 
the settlement of Europeans was really in the very lower part of Manhattan. I'm Leslie Harris. I'm a professor of history and African-American studies at Northwestern University. The title of my first book is In the Shadow of Slavery, African-Americans in New York City, 1626 to 1863. Some things would still look familiar in the 18th century city if we were to visit New York today. For example, Broadway was already established as a central corridor between the south end of the city linking the British fort at the very tip of the island, and then the commons. So a really straight line about one mile between those two locations. And that becomes a really important central axis for the city in the 1770s when it starts to get populated by political monuments that reorder this space as a politically charged and deeply symbolic space for all kinds of revolutionary contestations. Founded by the Dutch as the trading settlement of New Amsterdam in 1624, New York City began as a small settlement on the southern tip of Manhattan Island, between the Battery and Wall Street. Now, most early New Yorkers lived within the confines of this small area. However, as the city grew, so did its boundaries and the cosmopolitan nature of its populace. Even in its earliest days, New York City had a multicultural population. There were many different kinds of people speaking all kinds of languages, religions, and it was perceived by Europeans as a place that was very multicultural. One European famously said, it hurts the European eye to see so many Black people here. But it wasn't just Black people. There were people who were there who spoke Dutch, who remained from the Dutch period of time. And the British really wanted it to be one of the port capitals of North America for them. So as with any port city, lots of different ships from all over the world came through New York at that time, much like they do today. New York had a deep natural harbor, and this made it extremely attractive as a place for Britain to establish a key port for Atlantic trade, but also to establish itself politically. The British hoped to turn New York into the slave trading capital of North America for the Royal African Company. They were ultimately beaten at that goal by Rhode Island. But because of that emphasis on the slave trade in the founding of New York by the British, again, you have lots of ships that are coming in. You have a lot of people who are engaged with the slave trade. And certainly by the early to mid decades of the 18th century, about 40% of New York households owned at least one enslaved person. The majority tend to be women in urban areas. If you're talking about enslaved people, they perform domestic labor in the home. Where the Dutch developed a place of trade, the British worked to develop a place of trade in slavery. Now, this made a lot of sense, as slavery proved to be a very profitable business, and New York City had a deep natural port that could accommodate hundreds of ships. But how exactly did the British work to build New York into one of its premier slave trading ports in the Atlantic world? And what did the British emphasis on the slave trade mean for daily life and politics in mid-18th century New York City? One of the ways that it did that was by bringing in these slave ships, either from the Caribbean or directly from Africa. As it turns out, shipments directly from Africa into New York didn't really pick up until the mid to later 18th century. But many merchants in New York had connections to the Caribbean. So most slave cargoes, as they were called then, went directly to the Caribbean. But when buyers in the Caribbean had absorbed as many enslaved people as they could, the remainder of those people would then come to North America. And so sometimes they would come all the way up to New York. And then merchants in New York who also had connections with slave owners in the Virginia, Maryland area and farther south would then try to sell enslaved people south as well. Creating an emphasis on the slave trade in early New York meant that the politics of the colony generally supported strong imperial rule, because strong imperial rule helped protect New Yorkers from slave rebellions. Particularly during the British period, we see an uptick in the rebellion of enslaved people people running away from owners. Being enslaved in a place like New York or even in the rural hinterlands of New York could be very lonely for the enslaved people. Most 
slave owners only own one slave. And so these are also people who are not allowed to have families. Enslavers in New York City in particular would prefer that women did not have children. So many of them were frustrated, understandably, by not being able to have families, by not being able to have community, by feeling less than. At times, we have organized rebellions in 1712 and in 1740, where people set fire to the homes or the businesses of their enslavers, seeking freedom. One of the things that unites whites across this whole diverse region is the fear of slave rebellion, the fear of losing that wealth that they hold in human bodies and the possibility of extracting more wealth through the production of sugar or tobacco or whatever the slave-produced goods are. So there's a huge fear on the part of whites that enslaved people will try to overturn the system. By 1790, the enslaved population of New York City rivaled that of North America's largest slave city, Charleston, South Carolina. So whites had good reason to fear slave rebellions in New York. The system of slavery and fear of slave uprisings meant that in addition to being a bustling and thriving port town with a multicultural population, New York City was also a place of violence and unrest. In fact, nearly 50 years before the American Revolution began, New Yorkers had become adept in witnessing, participating in, and putting down mass protest actions. Two of the most famous slave rebellions in New York, where you really see enslaved Africans trying to change the system. One is in 1712, where a group of recently arrived enslaved people, we believe from Africa, late at night set fire to some of the homes in the area. And when whites come out of those homes to put out the fires, enslaved people attack them. And we believe that they were both trying to escape and also trying to encourage other enslaved people to join them whether or not to take over that settlement or just to leave New York City and to go off on their own. They are overwhelmed by whites who capture them, put them in jail, they're put on trial, many of them are executed. And in 1741, the famous, what was called the Negro Slave Plot, there are a series of fires in Manhattan, and it's believed that a group of men started those fires one man in particular, Quack, as he was called, which is a perversion of a West African named Quaco, it's believed that he was separated from his wife. And so out of revenge for that separation, he set fires. At any rate, by the end of this rash of arson attacks, which may have included many other reasons for enslaved people to set fires to different places in New York, Several groups of enslaved people were captured, put on trial. Many of them were executed. Others were shipped to the Caribbean as punishment. Before the American Revolution, New York City was a place of protest. Enslaved people, frustrated with their bondage, their inability to have and form families, and their lack of liberty, sometimes expressed their anger by running away, setting fires, and generally rebelling against New York City's system of slavery. So. How did white New Yorkers protect their investment in people, ships, and real estate? As Leslie Harris noted earlier, fear of slave rebellions united whites across the British Empire. So, what kinds of protections against rebellions did the British Empire offer New Yorkers as it tried to turn New York City into a slave trading capital of the Atlantic world? It was key that a fort named Fort George was established at the very tip of the island because it also indicates the centrality of Manhattan at this time as a military and imperial center for the British Empire. Anyone sailing into New York Harbor would have seen, they would have been greeted by this towering fort at the tip of the island. We have few sketches of the fort itself to really understand what it looked like, but we do have some textual descriptions that indicate that the walls were significantly tall to keep people out presumably, but also to protect the troops that would have been stationed inside the fort. And the fort was also the residence for the royal governors of New York. So during the 1760s and 1770s, it was where the Lieutenant Governor Cadwallader Calden had his residence. 
New York is unusual in being such an imperial stronghold. So the presence of officials of the crown and thousands of British troops is really significant in the city throughout this time period. The British Empire established Fort George as a seat of power in the Atlantic world. As Wendy Bellion related, the fort served as the home of the imperial government of New York. Inside the fort lived the royal governor and thousands of soldiers. In fact, after the end of the Seven Years or French and Indian War in 1763, New York City and Fort George became the British Empire's North American headquarters. It was from New York City where General Thomas Gage oversaw the empire's military needs across North America, and it's where the Royal Post Office oversaw its North American operations. The protections the British Empire provided New York City against slave rebellions, piracy, and other riotous actions was a large military and imperial presence. With that said, riots and rebellions still occurred in this North American imperial capital. In addition to the slave uprisings of 1712 and 1741, there were also the Stamp Act protests of 1765. Immediately outside the fort was a public space that was called Bowling Green. It was literally a space for bowling. Of course, it began as indigenous ground. It was part of the ancestral homeland of the Leni Lenape. After the Dutch settled the city, it was a space for grazing cattle. It was a market space. It was also a parade ground for military exercises. In the middle of the 18th century, colonists petitioned George II to use it as a space of leisure to literally use it as a space for playing bowls. The king grants their wish, and that's where the term Bowling Green comes from. What's important about that is that the fort and Bowling Green together really helped to characterize this corner of New York as a royalist stronghold, as a royalist neighborhood. Bowling Green is so important to the spatial politics and the cultural memory of New Yorkers. It's really where New York gets remade again and again and again. And that's even really true today because it's continued to be a space that's been populated by public sculpture and that draws people as a site of protest. This is where the Occupy Wall Street protests began back in 2011, for example. In the 18th century, one of the things that made Bowling Green so significant is that it is the beginning and the end point for any kind of imperial parades that originated out of the fort. So literally walking to and from Bowling Green became part of an imperial ritual. By the time that we get to the 1760s, rebellious colonials have their eye on Bowling Green. They understand that this is the space where England is going to mark its ground in New York City. So one of the things that we can talk about, for example, are the Stamp Act protests in 1765 and the ways in which the self-named Sons of Liberty staged protests that erupted at Bowling Green. The American Revolution began in part because Great Britain sought to reform its imperial governance. British victory in the Seven Years' War expanded Great Britain's imperial holdings in North America and made the British Empire a global empire. In an effort to govern its worldwide territories, officials in London sought to consolidate colonial governance and to tax those living in its colonies so that it could support the military establishments that it needed to protect its territories. To raise the revenue it needed to protect Great Britain's North American territories, Parliament passed a series of revenue acts. The first major revenue act that Parliament passed on its North American colonies was known as the Stamp Act. It passed that act in March 1765. The Stamp Act detailed or enumerated 55 types of documents that had to be handwritten or printed on paper embossed with a stamp from the Treasury Department. The price for each stamp varied from 10 pounds for an attorney's license to somewhere between 3 pence and 10 shillings for other types of paper. The Stamp Act is familiar. It's the first major taxation act that's passed by the British Parliament in 1765. It's meant to take effect in November of 1765. But well before then, colonists in cities up and down the eastern seaboard begin staging protests and marches, tarring and feathering stamped paper, let alone stamp collectors themselves in areas like Boston. In New York, 
This meant that the Sons of Liberty came together at the Commons, at the northern end of Broadway, and they stage a march that eventually culminates at Bowling Green. So just as colonial governors emerged from the fort in Bowling Green and moved up and down Broadway, the Sons of Liberty would more or less replicate that, moving south through wharves, through markets, and then circle back to the commons. The reason that the Stamp Act crisis is so important in this story is that it is the first time that the Sons of Liberty claim Bowling Green as their space. Parliament passed the Stamp Act without a colonial presence in Parliament. So colonists from New Hampshire down to Georgia protested this act of taxation as it had been passed without their representation, and because the act was so broad that it touched on nearly every aspect of colonial life. In New York City, New Yorkers took their cries of protest directly to the seat of Great Britain's imperial power in North America, Fort George. So in reaction to the news of the stamped papers arriving in New York, the Sons of Liberty, also called the Liberty Boys, stage a protest at Fort George. They rattle the gates of the governor's residence. And even more terrifying for Cadwallader Colden, who's holed up inside the fort, they have an effigy of Colden that they are parading publicly, together with an effigy of the devil. And this was not uncommon. Effigies were very popular as devices of political protest in the 18th century. And they were created in part in order to publicly punish and humiliate the people that they represented. So after rattling at the gates of Fort George, the Sons of Liberty carry these effigies of the devil and Cadwallader Colden. Both appear to be hanging from a gallows. They roll this into Bowling Green. They seize Cadwallader Colden's carriage and carry that into Bowling Green. And then they light everything on fire, so it all goes up in flames. The civil unrest inspired by the Stamp Act startled Parliament. They endured months of news about violent uprisings throughout its North American colonies and protests raised by English merchants who traded with America. This news of unrest made Parliament realize that they had little hope of ever generating revenue from stamps. So Parliament repealed the Stamp Act in March 1766. In response to the repeal of the Stamp Act, colonials up and down the eastern seaboard decide to raise statues in tribute to William Pitt, who was a British minister, sometimes prime minister. Pitt was understood to be the great hero of the Americans because he had stood up in Parliament and he had defended colonial rights against taxation without representation. New York and Charleston, South Carolina, are two of the cities that managed to raise a statue in tribute to Pitt. New York very much takes its cue from Charleston. But the Livingston family, who are a very powerful family in New York City, probably wisely realize that it would be inadvisable to order a statue of Pitt and not one of the king, especially for such an imperial stronghold like New York City. So the commissions go forth to London because For all intents and purposes, there's really no one capable in early America at this time of designing, creating, and delivering sculptures on the order of what colonies had in mind. In celebration of the Stamp Act's repeal, and in honor of the man who made that repeal possible, colonists along the Atlantic coast erected statues of William Pitt. But given New York's status as Great Britain's North American headquarters, New Yorkers felt that they should also erect a statue to their king, King George III. So both of the commissions end up in the hands of one of the foremost sculptors of the day, a man named Joseph Wilton. Wilton himself was a young, up-and-coming sculptor. It wasn't long before he himself came to the attention of King George III, and he was appointed to the royal position called Sculptor in Ordinary which meant that he actually held an honorary title at court. It was very unusual to have sculptures to living people at this time, whether they were Pitt or the king. There's considerable concern about the kind of power that a sculpture can exert upon people looking at it. 
Remember, this is not too far removed from the period of the Protestant Reformation, when sculptures and religious objects were thought to exert a near idolatrous kind of seductive capacity on the people who looked at them. As Wendy Bellion noted, New York's desire to represent a living monarch with a statue was unusual. And it was unusual not just in Great Britain's colonies, but also in London, the capital of the British Empire. One thing to say right at the outset is the most obvious representation of the king is George III himself going about his business in the West End of London. This is Arthur Burns. He's a professor of modern British history at King's College London and the academic director of the Georgian Papers program, a program that is digitizing all of the papers of Great Britain's King Georges and their families. The king is quite often to be found moving around that area himself without much distance from the people, so that people are quite capable of getting close enough to him to throw things at him and to look through the windows of the carriages and he doesn't seem to have any great need to distance himself from the people. So that, I think, is the most important thing to have in mind, that the king himself, going to the theatre or going to concerts or just doing his duties, is a fairly standard feature of London. And actually, in some ways, that may be one reason why there aren't very many statues in London at the time. There's one in Somerset House, put up in around about 1775, where he's standing over the River Thames. It's a very classicised figure. There's one that goes up in Berkeley Square around about 1772. But those are the main statues in London. Otherwise, you'd have to go outside London, where there are quite a few. Other than that, where would you have seen him? Well, you've seen him on your money. You'd have seen him in terms of his cipher. You'd have seen him more than him himself. So the royal coat of arms would be ubiquitous. It would be there in every church. It would be there in every legal building. It would be there on some of your newspapers and other legal documents that you'd have encountered. London didn't need many statues to its living monarch, because King George III could often be seen in person about the city as he traveled to different events and meetings. With that said, like many empires, Great Britain had a long tradition of displaying images of its sovereign around its empire. It may be partly just tradition by this date, I think if you go back to the Tudors and so on, it's clear that these portraits have a very important role as a kind of representation of royal power and authority. There's a particular portrait by Alan Ramsey, the magnificent picture of George III in his coronation robes, which I think Ramsey's studio has more than 150 copies of that, that he's promising to put the finishing touches to every single one. And those you can often now find in English country houses. You can find them, I think, at the time in governor's buildings. You can find them. Courtiers have given them as well. So they're distributed really to people who feel they want an image of the monarch. Quite apart from those images, you've also got all the miniatures, which are ubiquitous in this period, which small portraits of the monarch are distributed again to those who have some personal relationship with him. Benjamin West paints a whole series of portraits of the monarch, either on his own or with the Queen. There's Johann Zoffany, who does a series, again, remarkable portraits, perhaps the most remarkable being one of George III and his family. Where are you going to find those in the empire? You're going to find them in America. Images of the living monarch have power. Both literally and as a metaphor, the monarch was supposed to represent a unification of the empire in his body. So portraits of a living monarch performed several duties. A portrait of a king reminded subjects of their place as subjects within a larger empire. Images of the king exude the power and sanction of royal authority when displayed in government buildings and in courts. And portraits of the monarch also provide courtiers or government officials a way to show everyone that they are loyal to the empire and may have the favor of the king. As Arthur Burns alluded to, images of living monarchs proved most popular as portraits in coinage. Erecting a statue to a living monarch was much more unusual. One of the first things to say about the statue of King George III is it is a one of a kind in North America at this time. Nothing else like this existed among the 13 American colonies, which is to say it is the first equestrian statue of a European leader to find its way to North America. The statue of George III was monumental. It was larger than life, 
And when it was installed in Bowling Green, it was put upon a marble pedestal that in itself was about 15 feet tall. So you have to imagine encountering this statue in early New York. You might never have seen the face of George III. And suddenly you found yourself looking upward and very deliberately looking upward because you would never be looking down at the face of the king. They saw George III looking for all intents and purposes like a Roman emperor. So its size and its elevation upon this very tall pedestal were in themselves really important dimensions of the kind of power that this sculpture could exert within revolutionary New York. They start with a famous Roman reference point of the statue of Marcus Aurelius on horseback. That is a model which many people move to because I think that is partly seen as a way of making a statement about the nature of the king that's being portrayed because Marcus Aurelius is own standing as a kind of philosopher, ruler. So this is virtue by association that we're getting in this, as well as the martial aspect of being on horseback and looking fairly regal. This is very much a classicizing image of the king going back to that Roman notion of political authority that's so ubiquitous in Britain. Two other things about this sculpture are really important. One is that it was metal. It was molded out of lead, cast in lead, probably shipped to New York City in pieces and assembled on the site. Now, one really important thing about lead is that it's easy to work with. It had become very popular throughout the 18th century among sculpture workshops in London because it not only melted well and molded well, but it held up well against the elements. It was also easy to paint to simulate the appearance of other kinds of stone. In the case of the George III statue, it wasn't painted to look like marble or stone. Instead, it was painted to resemble gold. And this is really important. It was probably the brightest thing in the colonial landscape, this gleaming, gilded figure of the king towering on top of this marble pedestal. In so many ways, the statue of George III seemed completely anachronistic, probably out of place, and extraordinarily impressive in Lower Manhattan. Nothing like this had been seen before in the American colonies. New Yorkers installed their impressive gold-painted statue of King George III in August 1770. The day was marked with a parade and ceremony. Newspaper accounts document a procession of soldiers, royal officials, and civic leaders led by Lieutenant Governor Cadwallader Colden, leaving the gates of Fort George, processing around Bowling Green, and circling the statue's large base several times. After a few speeches and a gun salute to the health of their king and to the prosperity of the empire, the procession returned to the fort. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that this was really unusual. Nothing like this had ever happened in the American colonies before. To the best of our knowledge, there were no statues around which to parade. But yet it was quite familiar to anyone who understood the importance of fixing a statue into sight and then dedicating it. So these kinds of rituals were actually drawn from British practices and continental practices. So what seemed totally unfamiliar to bystanders in New York, to watch a group of people walk around a statue and to cheer its arrival and to cheer its significance, these are ritual practices that had long been part of public dedication ceremonies in Europe in the early modern period. And in many ways, New Yorkers could probably avail themselves more or less of a script. After its installation on its towering marble pedestal on Bowling Green in August 1770, the gold-painted statue of King George III stood facing the gates of Fort George in New York Harbor until July 9, 1776. During its six-year reign as a sight to see in the British North American colonies, visitors remarked on the statue's physical beauty and its visual power. So one of the people who visited the city shortly before the revolution was a continental doctor and soldier named Isaac Bangs. And he gave us one of the very first accounts of the city itself. He described the equestrian statue of George III as a present from himself to the city. 
So Bangs misunderstood how the sculpture actually ended up in New York. He thought it was kind of imperial presumption, not something that arrived because the Colonial Assembly actually wanted it. But then he went on to remark upon the classical appearance and iconography. And Bangs said, the man George is represented about a third larger than a natural man. The horse, in proportion, both neatly constructed of lead, gilt with gold, raised on a pedestal of white marble about 15 feet high, enclosed with a very elegant fence about 10 feet high, the two lower feet stone, and the remainder of open worked iron. Bangs went on to say, this, with several churches and other elegant buildings on either side of the spacious street, form a most beautiful prospect from the fort. Another important visitor to Bowling Green at this time was John Adams. He visited New York in 1774, and he described a beautiful ellipsis of land, nailed in with solid iron, in the center of which is a statue of His Majesty on horseback, very large, of solid lead gilded with gold, standing on a pedestal of marble very high. So we can see in these firsthand accounts from just a year or two before the statue came down that the park itself impressed visitors to New York. It struck a very elegant appearance. The size and the elevation of the statue were very impressive to visitors. And its gilded appearance was something that was also quite notable. Aside from the remarks of visitors, not much is known about the life of the King George III statue during its six-year reign in Bowling Green. Records reveal that in 1773, the New York Assembly passed an act to prevent the defacing of statues, and the new fence that John Adams noticed went up around Bowling Green. In June 1775, with fighting already started around Boston, the governor of New York led the soldiers in Fort George in a parade to Bowling Green and around the statue to celebrate the king's birthday. As they processed, New Yorkers greeted them with hisses and jeers to show their displeasure. But aside from the allusion to vandalism in this account of jeering, not much is known about how New Yorkers felt about their statue to King George III as the revolution gained momentum. That is, of course, until July 9, 1776. What happened in Bowling Green on July 9, 1776? We'll find out just after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. This episode is brought to you by the Omohundro Institute, proud publishers of award-winning books since 1943. In his celebrated account of the origins of American unity, John Adams described July 1776 as the moment when 13 clocks struck at the same time. So how did these American colonies overcome long odds to create a durable union capable of declaring independence from Britain? In a powerful new history of the 15 tense months that culminated in the Declaration of Independence, historian Robert Parkinson provides a troubling answer, racial fear. In his new book, 13 Clocks, Parkinson traces the circulation of information in the colonial news systems that link patriot leaders and average colonists. Parkinson reveals how participants in these new systems constructed a compelling drama featuring virtuous men who suddenly found themselves threatened by ruthless Indians and defiant slaves acting on behalf of the king. 13 Clocks was published by the Omohundro Institute and their publishing partner, the University of North Carolina Press. And 13 Clocks is now available in paperback for the low price of $20. If you want to read what one scholar calls the most original work on 1776 in a generation, then check out 13 Clocks by Robert Parkinson. Available now in paperback for $20. You can purchase a copy by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash clocks. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash clocks. During the American Revolution and War for Independence, Americans worried about the security of the messages they sent through private messengers and the Postal Service. In fact, many of the founders had their messages intercepted by the British, including John Adams. In the summer of 1775, John Adams had two letters intercepted when the British captured the messenger he employed to carry those letters from Philadelphia to Massachusetts. Now, one of those letters was addressed to Massachusetts political leader James Warren, and that letter detailed Adams' thoughts on independence and his contempt for some of his fellow congressmen. Much to Adams' chagrin, the British printed those letters 
in the Massachusetts Gazette newspaper and in London newspapers, causing some embarrassment for Adams. Now today, most of us communicate with others via email, text, and other internet-based messenger services. How do we know that our electronic communications are not being intercepted by unwanted third parties? The truth is, we don't know. Unless, of course, we're using a secure VPN service like NordVPN. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. It's a service that protects your connection to the internet and your online privacy. NordVPN is a service that protects your online identity by hiding your IP address. Your IP address is that string of numbers that allows your device to communicate with the internet. And NordVPN hides your IP address so that you can use the internet securely and without fear that your electronic communications, your data, or your web browsing will be intercepted. NordVPN protects you from this kind of digital theft by encrypting your internet traffic. It makes it so third parties or your internet service provider can't see what you're doing online or who you're communicating with, which means your data and communications are secure and your internet service provider can't throttle your upload speeds when you connect to file sharing services or engage in virtual gaming. Everyone deserves a secure and unrestricted internet. NordVPN makes this idea a reality. To find out more about NordVPN, visit nordvpn.com slash bfw. And when you visit nordvpn.com slash bfw, NordVPN will offer you a substantial discount of 73% off a two-year subscription, bringing the cost of your online security to $89 for two years. Protect your data and your identity. Visit N-O-R-D-V-P-N dot com slash BFW. July 9th, 1776 is not the day that we ordinarily celebrate as a holiday. Of course, that's July 4th. That difference in those five days is really important to note. So July 2nd is the day that the Continental Congress ratifies the Declaration of Independence. July 4th is the day that independence is officially declared. But July 9th is the date that New York signs its agreement to the Declaration of Independence. One of the things that we also have to remember is the Declaration of Independence was a spoken document. And what happens in Manhattan is that huge crowds gather at the commons. This is because the commons had become the place where American troops were stationed during the early battles of the American Revolution. And it's George Washington himself who orders that the Declaration be read aloud to the group of American soldiers who were gathered together at the Commons. Later that night, a crowd gathers in Bowling Green. This is a premeditated form of iconoclasm. People go to Bowling Green with the intent to pull down the King's statue. The Declaration itself had indicted the King for abuses against the American colonies, specifically naming him. So in many ways, it would seem natural that this tall, enormous, gleaming statue of the king, the surrogate for King George III in this most imperial of American cities, would become a target of anger following the reading of the Declaration. Iconoclasm. The act of destroying and removing art and symbols of authority has a really long history. According to Wendy Bellion, some of the best-known incidents of iconoclasm date back to classical Rome, where images of Roman rulers would be damaged or partially destroyed in acts that literally scraped out the surface of the ruler's face. We also know that iconoclasm happens in times of political change, in times of regime change. And the most famous instances of that are probably the French Revolution, when hundreds of sculptures of French kings were removed from public places and were either ritually punished buried, destroyed, or otherwise publicly desecrated. After hearing the words of the Declaration of Independence and the 27 grievances it charged against King George III, revolutionaries in New York City set out for their own act of symbolic destruction against the King's statue on Bowling Green. So we really have to think about the Declaration of Independence in New York as a kind of catalyst for the attack on the King's statue. They probably bring hammers axes, saws, and ladders. It probably was a long night of working to bring down this statue. Although we don't have any accounts of precisely what happened that night, 
We have accounts of what happened immediately after the statue comes down. And some of them are pretty gruesome. So we have one account from an onlooker of somebody pouncing upon the body of the king and literally scraping at the skin and the surface of the sculpture to remove some of the gilding. We know that the head came off. Precisely how it came off? Not entirely sure. Probably through the work of a lot of blows of a hammer and other kinds of really heavy instruments. But I like to imagine the reaction of the crowd as this surrogate head of the king was probably lifted up for the entire crowd to see. I mean, can you imagine the kind of cheers and jeers that the crowd would have erupted with? There were intentions to impale the head of the king on a stake uptown at what had become known as Fort Washington. And that in itself is really significant because that is the kind of punishment that common criminals would have been subjected to in England at this time. Instead, a British officer, a man named John Montresor, managed to claim the head. It was temporarily buried to conceal it from these rebellious colonists. And eventually the head was packed into a crate. It sailed back to England and it came to rest under the sofa of an aristocratic couple named Lord and Lady Townsend. Decapitating King George III's statue and scraping off his golden skin only accounts for a small portion of the colonists' acts of desecration. Using axes, hammers, and other heavy tools, the revolutionaries broke the king's statue into as many pieces as they could, and then they carted off those pieces to Connecticut, where they could be melted down and molded into bullets. So it's really important that the statue of King George III was made out of lead because the other thing that lead was important for besides creating large public sculptures was ammunition. And any kind of metal had become very scarce in the months leading up to the revolution as the British began to set up blockades around the port of New York and prevent any kind of supplies from reaching the city. In fact, Lead was such a precious metal for military purposes that the Common Council of New York ordered lead to start being removed from the windows of public buildings around the city. What gets commented upon immediately is not only that this is the symbolic fall of this British tyrant. What we see in the remarks of people who were there that night is a kind of carnal pleasure in getting their hands on this cache of lead that could be melted down and remade into bullets for the Continental Army. And that is precisely what happened with a vast part of the body of this sculpture. Pieces are gathered, they're conveyed by water to Norwalk, Connecticut, and then they begin a long, slow, heavy passage up through the western part of Connecticut, all the way to Litchfield, where there was a military depot, and where the governor of Connecticut, Oliver Walcott, and his family summon the townspeople who gather to help literally boil down these enormous pieces of lead into molten metal and then to refashion that lead into bullets using bullet molds. It seems that about 42,000 bullets were made from the body of the king. It seems that those who participated in destroying King George III's Bowling Green statue delighted in the idea that bullets made from the king's body would be used to shoot through the king's own soldiers during the Revolutionary War. But who was there that night? Like white New Yorkers, black New Yorkers also participated in the American Revolution. But did black New Yorkers take part in destroying the king's statue on Bowling Green? Yes and no. Certainly, I think, to the degree that the tearing down of the statue is an event something to be witnessed. I think many people would have turned out. What their feelings were about what was happening is something else. And they may be encouraged also to participate by their owners and have to think about even if participation is not what they personally would do, their owner is out there participating. So they will align with their owner and participate just to keep in good graces with their enslaver. They will be practiced in not only the acts of resistance, but also the meaning of liberty and all of the ways that their enslavers are using the term, we are enslaved to Britain, 
all of these things will resonate. And it's hard to imagine that there wouldn't be a, a bit of cynicism, if you will, to hear whites who are holding them enslaved complaining about being enslaved to Great Britain. And they use the language of the revolution. They say, if all men are created equal, so are we. We deserve our freedom. And so we can see during this time, not simply that Blacks are observing and witnessing, they are becoming active participants, because through that, they hope to gain their own freedom. But you may have others who, just like in any population, and indeed in the white population, who are nervous about the possible disruption that this is going to cause, who worry that the British are not any better as slave owners than the soon-to-be American patriots. From what historians have pieced together, it seems that all sorts of New Yorkers participated in the destruction of the King statue on the night of July 9, 1776. However, our memory of who participated in this event has changed over time. So in the immediate decades after 1776, all that remained standing in Bowling Green was the pedestal. So it did not come down, it stayed in place. And remember that this was a pretty impressive object in itself. A marble pedestal, 15 feet tall. It remained in Bowling Green until 1818. And over time, local New Yorkers reimagined it as a kind of accidental cenotaph. They reimagined it as a monument to the revolution itself. In fact, one of the people who saw the marble pedestal that had once hosted the King statue was King George III's third son, Prince William. Prince William is the spare rather than the heir. And for that reason, he is sent off for career development rather than just hanging around waiting to become the next monarch. So he gets a naval career at his father's encouragement. He sails out to North America in 1781, and he's sent with a very stern letter from his father not to let the side down and how important it is that he performs well. And he sails into New York in September, and he's writing to his father. He's a pretty uh, assiduous correspondent. You get the sense, actually, when you read William's letters, that he's expecting Dad to be interested in the stuff that he's sending home. And he sends him lots of details about which troops he's seen and what sort of morale they were in. He's trying to act a bit as the king's eyes on the ground in North America. And at the same time, he's representing the king to people on the ground in North America too. William is quite visible on the streets of New York. It's clear that George III is aware that it's a sensitive situation in New York. And clearly that's the context as well for this mention of walking past the plinth of the statue. Thanks to the efforts of the Georgian Papers program to digitize the papers of Great Britain's Georgian monarchs, we know that Prince William saw the statue's pedestal and sent word of what he saw to his father. It's virtually the first thing that happens when he lands in New York. He disembarks and he goes to what he's called the parade. He says, I saw the plinth. That's the way he reports. And it's a single line. He doesn't say any more about it. He doesn't say anything about the reaction he has to the fact that it's been taken down. It's a matter of fact statement. And I know we've occasionally speculated that there may be some sense in which this is deliberately intended to provoke his father by pointing out that he's seen this almost as kind of, kind of uh, early Prince Harry almost, sort of finding a way to poke away at the royal family. But I don't think that's the case. I think rereading it in the context of his other letters, it's actually almost rushed over. He feels he ought to tell his father that this is there, but he's not going to dwell on it. The statue's 15-foot high marble base, or plinth, wasn't the only way that New Yorkers remembered their act of mock regicide on the night of July 9, 1776. New Yorkers also remembered that night through visual depictions of the event. The first oil painting that represents the fall of the statue isn't created until about 75 years after the revolution. It's made in the early 1850s by a German immigrant named Johannes Ertel, a man who was himself fleeing revolution in his native Germany and emigrating to what had become the second largest German-speaking city in the world. That painting gave rise to a succession of engravings and other kinds of prints that were widely reproduced during the centennial period and then during the colonial revivals of the late 19th century. 
It's likely that you've seen Johanna Sertel's depiction of the toppling of King George III. The statue of King George stands atop its pedestal in the center of the painting. Around the plinth are white, black, and Native American men and women who have flung ropes over the statue and are pulling them more taut as if to pull the statue down. So one of the important things that happens over time as more and more artists begin to represent this scene of revolution in Bowling Green is that the crowds get bigger, and that seems to have an interesting parallel to the expanding size of the United States by the end of the 19th century when a lot of these images are being made, so that the size of the crowd in Bowling Green comes to stand in for the idea of an expanding nation itself. The other really important thing that happens over time is that the crowds become whiter and they become composed of purely male iconoclasts. By the time of the 1876 centennial, almost all of those figures have dropped out of view. And the crowd at Bowling Green is re-racialized as an entirely white crowd and an entirely male crowd. Now it's also represented as a crowd that's composed of both gentlemen and everyday laborers. So I think that collectively, this visual culture was starting to do something really important within the context of the broader colonial revival. So the wave of colonial revivals from the 1870s to the 1930s have been understood as this period of growing conservative nostalgia, a reaction against the growing diversification in terms of race and ethnicity of northern cities like New York, which were experiencing waves of immigration from all parts of Europe, art plays a really important role in communicating certain ideologies of race, gender, and class within this broader context of the colonial revival. Bowling Green emerges as a kind of flashpoint, a way of pointing to an American origin story a place where the United States can be said to begin. Down goes the horse and rider of George III, and up goes an American democracy in its place. And what these images collectively work to do over time is to suggest that that group of American citizens could be defined as white and as male. Another aspect all of the paintings and prints of the King statue on Bowling Green have in common is that the King statue remains fully secure on its pedestal. We never actually see the statue of the king falling from its place, 15 feet above the colonists. What these images actually picture, ironically, is non-destruction. They never show the statue of the king hitting the ground. And there's a fairly complicated explanation, I think, for why that happens. But it has to do in part with a rising Anglophilia of the colonial revival and a romanticization of the revolutionary period and English identity among elite white New Yorkers around 1900. So one of the ways in which 1776 is remembered by artists is through a highly romantic lens. Curiously, what happens in a lot of these pictures is that the figure of the British king comes back and he remains visible in American visual culture long after the sculpture had actually disappeared from the streets of New York. The printers and artists who produced images of the crowd on Bowling Green in July 1776 produced those images at a time when many Europeans immigrated to the United States, thereby changing the racial and ethnic composition of the urban Northeast. This change in the composition of the United States' citizenry and an increasing demand for women's rights and equality made American men nostalgic for, quote, a simpler time, a time when white men of every class did great things, like win a revolution and build a new nation. Of course, this view of history as a white, male-only affair has always been incomplete. It leaves out the contributions of women, Native Americans, African Americans, and people of other ethnicities and national origins who contributed to the American Revolution and the founding of the United States. It also leaves out the mix of people who really lived in New York City in 1776 and who participated in and witnessed the toppling of King George III's statue. Now, speaking of the King's statue, Wendy Bellion mentioned that one of the curious things that happened during the colonial revival period is that the figure of the British king comes back and remains visible in American visual culture. Which begs the question, 
In what ways has the figure of King George III survived in the United States? And does the image of the king still have power over how we remember the American Revolution? What's so interesting about the history of iconoclasm is that objects often remain in partial form. They hardly ever disappear entirely. So even though iconoclasm means image breaking, even though it purports to destroy and to eradicate and to erase, it seldom achieves that purpose. In fact, it seems to re-empower things and places and the histories and the memories of that which we try to destroy. So the tale of the tale of the horse, the horse's body, or the king's body, but the tale is different. It allows us to latch on to something recognizable from 1776. It's taken on a kind of power of a relic, an object that allows us to imagine ourselves present at the night of the fall of this statue. In any other circumstance, we probably would not pay a lot of attention to the tail of a horse. It just seems like this incidental detail. Of course, horses have tails, so this one had a tail too. Had we been present in Bowling Green in 1776, we probably would have been looking at the face of the king or his hands and what they were doing, not the tail of the horse. So this object has a kind of mnemonic power to it and a kind of reliquary power. It imagines us to have a kind of physical relationship. It helps us to kind of bridge the hundreds of years that have passed between now and 1776. Just as the words of the revolution matter, so does the art, sculpture, and objects of the event. In the case of the horse's tail, we are reminded of both the toppling of King George III's statue and the toppling of monarchy in North America. In their place, Americans created a democratic and republican form of government, a government of the people, for the people. Now, just as we consider and think about the words of the revolution, how and why they were written, the meaning and intent of the founders, we also need to consider and think about the objects that help give meaning to those words. Objects like the horse's tail, which reminds us of the king statue on Bowling Green and how the everyday men and women of New York made the decision to symbolically act out their hope that British rule would fall and the colonies would rise to become an independent nation. This episode was co-written and co-produced by Joseph Edelman, Liz Covart, and Karen Wolf. It was made possible, in part, with support from Humanities New York. The mission of Humanities New York is to strengthen civil society and the bonds of community, using the humanities to foster engaging inquiry and dialogue around social and cultural concerns. Learn more at humanitiesny.org. To find more information about our guest historians, Wendy Bellion, Leslie Harris, and Arthur Burns, visit the show notes page, where we'll have links to these scholars and their publications. You'll find the show notes at benfranklinsworld.com slash 306. Also on the show notes page, you'll find links to digital resources that Holly White has gathered for us. These resources include images of the horse's tail, the Johannes Ertel painting, as well as the letters that Isaac Bangs and John Adams wrote discussing King George III's statue. You'll find these resources at benfranklinsworld.com slash 306. The original and historic music you heard in this episode was composed and arranged by Joel Rosten. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.